You just press play on the Last Breath Hunt cast, home of the Huntroversy. We're here to entertain, educate, and engage. And in case you didn't know, you only live once. But if you do it right, once is enough. Don't waste it. All right, everybody, welcome to episode number 86 of the Last Breath Hunt Cast, home of the Huntroversy. If you are listening to our podcast for the very first time, my, what an interesting time you've stumbled upon us. We are in the middle of a Hail Mary, uh, full go, all in the balls, no dick. I'm just kidding. Wait. <laughs> coyote killing episode. So we are going full throttle to the max on coyote hunting, and we've brought in experts from all over around the country to tell the best pieces of knowledge, tips, ticks, tricks, tactics, sorry, coyote calls, set placements, wind setups, etc., cetera, um, from all over the Midwest and beyond, and how to kill more coyotes this winter. So in episode number 84, if you missed it, we had a Michigan Predator Hunting Award winner named Chris Creener. Um, puts up triple-digit coyote kill numbers every single winter. Episode number 85, we had Ozzy Clements, a person from our home state of Illinois who wins coyote tournaments here locally and at the national level as well. Killed 320 coyotes last year alone, which is incredible. Nuts. And this episode, Garrett, who do we have? We have John Collins on. So he is the host of Tooth and Claw TV. The guy is a predator-killing machine. Um, I'm I am super excited to talk to him, um, and he's got a, a he's got an awesome show. And like I said, it just it's chalked full of bobcats, fox, coyotes. I mean, so it's he, not specifically coyotes. He kills it all. Yep, anything that's got a fang. Yep, or a tooth. So <laughs> um, before we get into this, let's uh, let's shout out the the people who make this podcast tick. First off is going to be Badlands Gear. You know, we've been running their stuff for a while now. You're going to hear us talk about it more and more. But the one thing that I want to really highlight is the Bino Harness. So their Bino Harness is what put them on the map several years ago. I have had one for years now. I mean, years before we even started working with them. And now it's it's just a part of my hunting essentials. I don't care if I'm going shed hunting, if I'm going whitetail, mule deer, antelope, turkey, you name it, I have it with me. I've got the Bino D-Mag. I absolutely love it. It is completely sealed. You know, if, if you spend a good amount of money on your optics, your rangefinder, and your binos, you know, you want to keep them protected. I know there's some pretty amazing bulletproof warranty on a lot of the glass out there, but still, if you use your optics as much as we do, you know, spend a little bit of money and protect them. It fits to my body. It fits nice and close to my chest. I have no issue shooting it with my, my bow with it or a gun. Um, and like everything is, is right there. I've got a knife. I got my outdoor edge knives, uh, saddled on the side of it. And it just, it's, it's like a tactical piece of hunting gear. It's just, it fits me so well. And it's, it's a part of, of what I do when I go, like I, I literally have to have it with me. So that's just one thing that we love. I mean, let alone all the other garments, gear, and, and apparel that they run. Um, we've got a discount code that's going to be dropping in the last breath inner circle. You guys will want to tap into that and make sure you save some coin. And then the other uh, host, or I shouldn't say host, but really partner of this podcast is... Under Warmer. So Under Warmer is a heated base layer in which you can apply. You can wear it directly to your skin. It's a fitted bodysuit. So it comes in all different kinds of sizes. It's got eight air activated heating pads packs on it so think about it as a hand warmer pack there's eight of them they're larger than a hand warmer and it's very sleek so the you know the most dense part of this system which you can wear underneath your garments underneath your camo as a base layer um, is only going to be about a quarter of an inch thick so it's much less bulky than a uh, let's say milwaukee dewalt heated vest that um, you have to have that big charging bank for and things like that it's a um, between one and four time use product. If you choke off the air, um, meaning if you wear it, let's say for an hour, you can put it back into a Ziploc bag and get 11 more hours of heat out of it. Meaning if you're a hunter like us and you want to wear it for three or four hours, you can get three to four hunts out of it because it will emit heat for 12 hours. And when you choke the air off of it, um, you will do so and choking the heat out of it as well. So one more thing about Badlands, if you're kind of like a person like us, let's let's get it done one time, let's do it right and let's be done with it. I put all my tags in it. So as all my tags for Illinois hunting seasons come in and out, I put them there. They're right on my chest. That way if the DNR ever rolls up, 
or I have to tag an animal or anything like that. It is literally always on me every single place that I go because I take that piece of gear with me every single time I go hunting anywhere. So it makes sure you're always legal. And there's a nice little mesh pocket in there that you can put all your tags in. So dude, there's been times where like you're driving and you see a deer or see a coyote and I'll out of habit, I'll like reach for my binos on my chest. Yeah. And they're not there. No, I'm like, Oh shit. I got, I got to grab them out of the console. You know, you got your binos for your truck and then you got your hunting ones. And it's like, it just, it's so second nature now. It's like my pocket knife. I'll I'll reach for it all the time, but, um, it's a nice luxury to have when you're hunting for sure. Um, like we mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, this is the third guest. So if you missed episode 84, 85, we dropped those yesterday, the day before. They are also devoted for coyote hunting and predator hunting and how to kill more coyotes this winter. Today, though, we are talking to another special guest called John Collins, mm-hmm. like you said, host of Tooth and Claw TV. Uh, he's got an absolute night lights out killer YouTube channel. Um, you can find him on social all over. I am sure that this guy has killed quadruple if not quintuple digits of predators in his lifetime and he's an absolute machine at doing so so without further ado let's go ahead and uh give the man of the hour john collins a call let's see let's give him a ring here i'm gonna go that he's gonna pick up on ring two by the way okay and it's in the air okay there we go Hello, this is John. John, hello. This is Garrett and Grant with the Last Breath Huntcast. You are live. How are you? I'm doing good, guys. Doing good. How's the how's the weather out in Illinois? Oh, it's it is cold. We're actually starting to warm up. But to give you an idea, like last weekend, um, uh, ambient air temperature was anywhere from negative twelve to negative twenty throughout most of the state. So it's it's been a chilly winter. Right. Right. Well, have y'all been getting any of this crazy? Uh, winter weather that's uh, kind of sweeping across the country last few days oh yeah we have had um it's actually a record we've had 28 days where it has been in the single digits so right. it's it's cold i mean here here in mercer county illinois we've probably got a solid 14 to 16 inches of snow with drifts up yeah. to four and a half feet so it's right it's been harsh and you know we haven't had a winter like this in a long time and our wildlife is starting to really kind of kind of suffer our deer are are st- literally almost starving we can't bait or we can't supplemental feed here so it's just tough on those animals and the coyotes dude they are they're starting to really come in strong to the calls because they're they're just hungry everything everything's hungry this time of year aren't they so what about you How, how's the weather down there oh, it's horrible <laughs> we uh we've got the snow too not as much as you guys have we probably got I don't know, close to a foot of stuff on the ground, I guess. Uh, anywhere from 8 to 12 inches. You know, when it gets past 6 inches, it's all the same, right? Right. But uh, we had an ice storm that came through uh, last Friday and Saturday, and it's still clinging on, and it's been absolutely horrible. We've been, uh, uh, I've actually been without power for about, I don't know, 40 to 50% of the time since last Friday evening. So, you know, because I live in a rural area, and of course, we've got a lot more timber than you guys do, and uh, and you're all's neck of the woods, but a lot of our electric, rural electric lines are running through big blocks of timber. So right now, with this ice on the limbs, we got limbs falling out of the trees, and of course, they're hitting the power lines, and guess what happens? No Let's power. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, I need you to uh, shoot my wife a text message and let her know that anything after six inches doesn't matter. So. <laughs> hey. Hey, hey, you let her know with three inches make a baby. Yeah, hey, heck yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. So, um, John, without any further ado, you know, give everybody your three minute commercial who you are, uh, what you do, where you're from, and, you know, your accolades, your affiliations. Um, kind of let the listeners know. Sure. Well, like I said, my name's John Collins. I was uh, born and raised right here in Central Kentucky. I've actually lived in the same county in kentucky my entire life um i've worked in the outdoor industry for the last eight years uh do two different shows one is wired outdoors which is just your general type hunting show with turkeys and big game from white tail deer through elk uh, and everything in between Uh, then we've got tooth and claw tv which is my main job is a 100 percent predator hunting show uh chasing coyotes and bobcats and 
black bears, just anything that'll bite you or scratch you all across the country, you know, here from uh, east of the Mississippi stuff, plumb up into the northwest and down into the southwest and everything in between. Um, and, you know, we hit it, hit it pretty hard. And you can watch all that stuff on Amazon Prime, Amazon Fire, Waypoint TV, Roku, and, of course, we've got two YouTube channels wired up, Doors and Tooth and Claw TV. Yes, and, dude, your stuff is amazing. So I, I just I want the listeners to know that, that we – you know, we've kind of founded ourselves on you when we, when you got this lined up, it's, it's easy to kind of fall into the rabbit hole, if you will, and watching all these videos and watch them feed into each other. And so we did a little intro here and we just, we alluded that, um, even though this podcast really, the series that we're doing, we've got some pretty awesome people on, um, to talk about it uh, is, is centered around coyotes. You kill everything. Just like you said, if it can bite you or scratch you, you hunt it. I like going after it. That's right. <laughs> all right well um without further ado let's go ahead and jump into it john um sure where do you hunt most of your predators at you could take that answer as a state or as a region um but we're talking sure. about coyote hunting here so where's the majority mm-hmm. of the time and places that you spend coyote hunting done at oh uh, definitely most of my time is spent um in kentucky central kentucky um you know i hunt several other states i spend a lot of time in wyoming in Kansas would probably be the next would be number two and number three but definitely definitely most of the time I'm hunting right here in Kentucky probably anywhere from 60 to 80 percent of my season to spend in Kentucky coyote hunting. Now what about the time is there a sprint time of the year you now that's a rigged question because you hunt them year round but pretty, you know, pretty close pretty close I'm not I would consider myself a, a year round hunter for predators I'm usually hunting I usually start making my, what I call the first stands of the season for me is usually uh, real late spring, early June, you know, right there around Memorial Day, uh, usually, you know, June 1st, so to speak. And then I'll run it through this time of year, usually right through February. So pretty much like March, April, May, I'm kind of drifting away from coyote hunting just because we do so much turkey hunting. We start doing a lot of turkey hunting. We do it. We actually do a, a separate you know, I told you we did two shows. We actually do uh, uh, four shows. We do two shows for Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, the actual state department here in Kentucky, and one of them is a spring hunting, a spring turkey hunting show. So I've got to start scouting pretty hard come March. Uh, of course, the show's going on in April, and then I'm kind of using uh, May. I'll go travel around, do a little bit of turkey hunting, a few other places too, you know, up in the northeast, and then hit a couple western states. So I'm spending about three three months kind of concentrating solely on turkeys and the rest of the time, you know, we'll be making coyote stands. Nice. Now what about time of day? Do you hunt them during the day? Do you hunt them at night? How do you prefer to hunt coyotes? I'm pretty much 100% daytime hunter. Uh, nothing against, nothing against night hunting. I know it can be a blast and I know a lot of guys that, you know, uh, that's what they live for is night hunting. You know, they really stack up huge numbers doing it, but, uh, I'm 100% daytime. Every place I go, you know, we're making daytime stands. You know, one of the big reasons is because we were filming our hunts, and it's uh, you get a lot better quality footage in the daytime versus night. Uh, so that's a, that's a big factor. Uh, second part is 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 I get pretty sleepy when the sun goes down. I just hang on my TV. <laughs> when it gets dark, I'm ready to sit on the couch or or. Uh, uh, in the lazy boy and watch a little TV and hang out with the with the wife and family. And plus, you know, wife's pretty good looking, so you know I don't be running around <laughs> in the dark too much. They're sitting at the house without me, right? Right. Heck yeah. So, <laughs> so that's this is great because before you, um, this is a multi part series, um, and just so you know, we had multiple people request that we have you on. So um, again, awesome, awesome. Want to say thank you for taking some time, but us sure. here in Illinois, we. We have a restricted time that we can hunt coyotes at night, and it's a pretty mm-hmm. hefty investment. So you're talking to a, a couple of guys that really we, – we do almost all of our hunting um, during the day as, as well. So this will be really right. interesting for us and I think a majority of our listeners, especially because daytime hunting is a lot more financially feasible. You can take, right. your, you can take your hunting rifle or you don't have to take such a big investment in a thermal or night vision optic. Um so speaking of that, I'd, I'd like to ask you about your go-to coyote rifle. 
Um, mm-hmm. If you can get as in depth as you want or as vague as you'd like, but um, you know, go through what it is, what caliber, the optic that you have on top. Do you run a bipod? Do you want a tripod? Kind of break it down for the listeners to know what a literally a famous predator hunter uses to kill coyotes. Sure. Well, uh, you know, I'm a I'm a boat gun guy. I've always loved bolt action rifles. Um, and I, what I'm doing is I'm shooting usually anywhere. I'm usually shooting up to three different rifles throughout the year. And the only reason I'm, I'm using so many, uh, you know, a lot of people just using one rifle and that's all they use. Uh, I could definitely do that. But my problem is, is there's three calibers that I absolutely love. And I just like throwing, giving every, every single, you know, all three of them a little bit of, a little bit of a trigger time. You know, I like to kill a few coyotes with each one of them every year, but uh, using a uh, 243, you know, 243 is, it don't matter what caliber ever comes out past, you know, us talking today through the end of time, the 243 will always be in the top five um, coyote calibers of all time. Plus it cross over, crosses over well into, you know, the big game hunt stuff like deer and uh, antelope and mule deer type stuff. So I always love the 243. So I'm shooting one of them a little bit. And then the other one is a 22 250. I throw it right there at the 243. It will always be in the top five coyote hunting cartridges of all time. I love the 22 250. But the gun that I'm using the most is a 22 Creedmoor. It's a I can shoot I can shoot a 80 grain missile at the same speed as I can take my 22 250 and shoot a 55 grain bullet. Yep. So I hey, I'm mean, I'm talking about it chills coyotes. So I'm shooting a 22 Creed more the most. And it's a boat gun. It's a, actually a custom built rifle. It's made by Hager Custom Rifles, a, a rifle builder right here in Central Kentucky. It makes exceptional, exceptional rifles. All three of those guns are built by him and are pretty much set up all the same. Um, shooting a carbon, shooting you know proof research carbon barrels, AG composite fiber fiber uh, carbon fiber stocks, and uh, they're light they're lightweight rigs you know just right there around seven pounds and that's what i like to shoot a lightweight gun and i've usually got them sitting on some sort of swagger bipod either the qd42 or the hunter 42 and that's what i'm hunting off of all of them you know i've always shot my dad kind of brought me into using a, a little poke scopes ever since i was young you know it's the only thing i've ever known so it's, it's always treated me right so i'm running little poke scopes VX fives and VX six sixes on all, on all three uh, all three rifles. Gotta love that gold ring and and something interesting. We talked to a gentleman from South Dakota, and it w- it was one of the first times that we had heard of the twenty two Creedmoor, and that's the mm-hmm. caliber that that he uses as well. So I, I mm-hmm. think it's kind of catching some popularity, especially in this sport, because of just what you said. You can you can cook that load, and it's fast, it's flat, and it hits like a hammer. Um, it, it's it's yes, sir. It's got a. It's all it's all pros when it comes to the twenty two Creed. More. I mean, I guess if you ever was going to say a negative for it, you know, a con is it could it could eat up barrels pretty bad. But you know, a lot of us ain't ain't shooting you know thousands upon thousands of rounds out of these guns. But you know, they're kind of you know I you know I don't know. I haven't shot the barrel out yet. I don't. I'm kind of looking to see you hear stories on how quick they'll shoot out. You know, I'm hearing. Some people shooting them out in a thousand rounds. You hear some people say 1,500, 1,800. I guess we'll find out. But uh, I'm really enjoying the caliber. It's very, it's uh, very fun to shoot. And uh, you can do a lot of stuff with load builds, you know, reloading for it. I mean, it's a, it's a legit, you know, thousand yard gun. I run steel out there to a thousand yards with it, just playing around, even out of the light setup, you know, sitting on a bench. They're, uh, they're, they are fun to play with. And I actually think, as long as they get the Sammy specs right, I think it'll actually be one of the one of the next factory offerings. Will be the twenty two Creed where you'll start seeing them factory factory produced guns here sometime surely. Wow. So speaking of optics again, I just want to ask you, what is your typical magnification range on your scopes? Uh, I think my VX six. I I don't run like the big three to eighteen. I'm running like the two two to twelve, and my VX fives are the. Uh, are the three to three to 15 and and usually that uh i rarely even crank it up to that high high spot i'm usually sitting on coyote stands with that power turn it uh, somewhere in between seven and ten 
Um, a lot of times it's at 10. You used to always joke around with one of my buddies from uh, down in Arkansas that I hunt a lot with named Jeff Ryder. Uh, we'll be sitting on these little old bobcat stands. It's pretty tight, you know, out in Kansas. You can't see 40 yards or something like that. And he'll look over at my gun and say, hey, won't you turn that scope down a little bit? Sitting there on 10, what do you think you're going to do? And I'm just, <laughs> I'm just one of those guys that I could actually, actually probably get away with a fixed power uh, fixed power 10 power scope. But yeah, usually somewhere between 7 and 10 is where I'm keeping them. Like I said, you know, this gun here, it's a, it's a, it's a three to 15 that I've got on a 22 creed more. And that's something pretty interesting. It's a lot of guys, I think when they buy a scope, they're automatically boom, they roll all the way up. And when, if you are not being able to pull that gun up second nature, it can sometimes be difficult to find your target in the scope. I mean, by, oh, man, by yes. backing That's it cost, out. That cost a man a mini a coat. Yep. Back it out. <laughs> get them in your scope because usually you got the drop on them, hopefully. And then if you mm. got time, reach up, turn it up. And take your shot, but I think that's interesting. I'm, I'm. Thank you for sharing that because I think it's, it's good knowledge for the listeners. No, you don't need a telescope on top of your rifle. Um, right. So my question after that, John, is what do you think your average shot distance is on a coyote? Probably eighty yards. Oh, dang! Really? Yeah, you're you, calling them into the lap, huh? Yep. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's uh, that's the name of the game when you coyote comes, call them up. Well, speaking of that, John, our next question that we have for you, logically, right after that, is what what calls do you use? So you're an electronic guy, a hand guy, a mouth caller. Uh, what do you use for setting up on coyotes specifically? Yeah, you know, mostly run an electronic call. Um, I do keep hand calls with me. I keep them in my call bag just in case you know how it is. Everybody that's called predators for any length of time has been on a coyote stand or they've either didn't bring enough batteries for the remote, run out of, run yeah. out of battery on the remote, or had a call go dead because they didn't charge the batteries up. Uh, so I always keep uh, keep a couple hand calls in my pack. Uh, rarely use them. Rarely use them. Uh, but I do blow on a mouth diaphragm uh, a lot during the breeding season, which is right now, you know, howling and answering back with my e-call. And plus, in the summertime, I'm running diaphragm howlers quite a bit uh, just to get, throw in a little bit extra you know, realism there, but I'm running Fox Pro game calls. I've, I've run Fox Pro for years. I have zero reason to run anything else. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, talk to us about a decoy. So recently we brought we bought a decoy, and we feel like it's uh, kind of interesting. Um, there's two different kinds I want you to talk about here. So you know those uh, calls that sometimes will be built into it. Like I know, for example, a Lucky Duck has a um, a call that kind of stands up out of the top of the call there, kind of like an antenna sure. and yep. has that little rabbit decoy. And then a, an actual physical coyote decoy. Have you ever run either of those two things? And what have your results been? Yeah, I've run about everything, you know, in the past. And, um, I'm somebody it's, it's a little bit different. Uh, last several years, I haven't run a decoy in probably at least three, three years, maybe even four years. Um, and there's a few reasons upon that. Uh, one of the reasons is with coyotes, a lot of times when you get coyotes coming in, if they key in on that decoy really hard, it's hard to get them to stop. I like getting my coyote stopped and shoot them exactly where I want to with a good, solid, you know, high percentage shot instead of trying to run, shoot them on the run. Uh, so that's one of the reasons. And sometimes, you know, you don't get them stopped. Right. They come crash into the call and turn around and burn out. And there you are left with either trying to shoot a coyote running in we're trying to shoot a coyote that's burning out after he's got a nose full of that call. The second part is to that with coyotes is if you call in multiples. Everybody's been on that situation where you call in a family group in the fall or the winter. And uh, say you call in four coyotes and you kill two or three of them. And one or two of them gets away, right? Well, the next thing you do, you might come in and hunt that farm again in a couple months down the road. And you call those one or two coyotes back up that got away from you. You're running your decoy. They see that decoy, they can shy off on it. They can remember it. And it's kind of like uh, if you guys turkey hunt, and I'm sure some of the guys that listen turkey hunt, if you've ever messed up on a tom turkey coming into a decoy set, turkeys get uh, what they call decoy shy. Oh, yeah. Coyotes can do the same thing. So if you've messed up on a coyote that's seen a decoy, man, you, you might have ruined him on it, and it might cost you a coyote again later on down the road. But then the third part of it is, is with bobcats. A lot of times, if you ever look up Google uh, on the internet, you know, bobcat hunting, you see all these articles come up, and you'll see everybody talking about, uh, 
using decoys for bobcats. Everybody keeps talking about it. I always use decoys. Well, I found something interesting when it comes to bobcats. You know, bobcats is kind of a passion of mine. We're going to kill three of them a year here in Kentucky, and a lot of times I'm tagging out on them. It's one of the reasons I hunt Kansas. Kansas is full of bobcats. I can go out there and kill a few bobcats a year after I get done here in Kentucky. We've had a really good bobcat year this year. Uh, I tagged out early in one month. Tagged out in December. Went out to Kansas, killed two more. Come back and got a couple of other buddies on bobcats. The thing is with bobcats when it comes to a decoy is I have found out that a lot of times when you hear all these stories about bobcats uh, coming to the edge of cover and just sitting down and looking around, well, usually why they do that is because of a decoy. They catch that movement. They hear, they're they initially coming because of your calls playing. Right. Well, it's when they hit the, hit the edge of cover where they can see where the call's at, and then they see that decoy moving, and say, oh, well, there it is. Sometimes they'll come on into it. You know, that does happen. But a lot of times they sit down and watch and stare and see what's going to happen with the thing. What I found out, when I, I, I would see that all the time. So I stopped running a decoy or actually what happened was is i called a bobcat up without running a decoy and a sucker come all the way up and stuck his head right in the horn of my cs 24c <laughs> i was like man i was like what in the world you know so i stopped using a decoy and what i found out that they don't when they come to the edge and see and see you know look and they can see where that sound's coming from but they don't see nothing twirling around they're still like actually not seeing anything what i found out instead of stopping and sitting down they walk right up to the call to see what's making that noise and i think we killed five bobcats this year within five feet of the call without running a decoy that's incredible so what do they so do when they get that close anymore. what do they do when they I, get that close john do they just sit down on their back haunches and look at it usually usually everyone that we've called right up to the call will walk right up to it and stand there for several seconds staring at it or they'll actually just they'll get real close to it, and they'll stretch their body out and stretch their neck out and get their nose close to it and start sniffing of it. And then usually they'll back out and start to leave away from it. We mm-hmm. did have one situation this year. We had a had a bobcat come up, and he got within about eight foot of it and crouched plumb down to his belly and got within two foot of it and jumped up and took both front paws and smacked it like you'd smack somebody in the head with both with two hands <laughs> and then bolted off run about 10 foot off stop turn around and buddy killed it so man i'm one of those that's guys awesome. i'm supposed to be in the i'm supposed to be in the business trying to sell decoys you know to people but i don't run a decoy well you got to be honest and I, and I appreciate that i mean you know, we're, we're in kind of the same boat where we have to support companies that support us, but I think it's important to note, yes, they can work, but, um, Oh, they, they definitely, they definitely work. I mean, uh, I've seen coyotes, you know, running decoys before, uh, used to run a fox jack on the back of a fox crow shockwave. And I've seen coyotes just kind of trotting, coming to a rabbit distress. Well, they get where they can see that decoy. Man, they kick it up two years and come kicking up dirt, son, you know, and run plumb right over top of it. <laughs> yep. They're right there as a testament let you know that they do work. There's no doubt about it they work. It's just my, how I like to call codes, it doesn't fit in. Well, and I think it's interesting to know you hit it on the head. If you got a single come in, there's a great chance you can get it done. A double, still, still good chances you can get it done, but you educate every single coyote that you don't kill. And exactly. you're gonna you're gonna have that experience. So the one thing that you didn't touch on: Do you ever run a like a coyote decoy? A, a you know, I know like Flambeau makes one. We've right. seen guys on the internet that actually use like stuffed sure. ones. Do you see that in your arsenal? Or is that just foobar? I've done that. I've done that years ago, like in a breeding season, and it's kind of the same thing. You just kind of get a coyote when they get into view; they kind of just skirt around. Um, I never did have great success with it. Now, in the summertime, we do a little bit of decoy hunting with my buddy Jeff, Jeff Ryder, decoy dog. And when they see a live dog out there, they'll sure, they'll sure engage, engage those. But I've never had a tremendous amount of luck have a full body coyote decoy. I'll probably never, ever use one ever again. Interesting. Sure. Okay. Um, how about your camo, John? Specifically talking about like this time of the year, like your, your Midwestern typical coyote hunting guy who's going to start, you know, after their deer season's finished in January and hit them end of January, all February and into March. Uh, what kind of camo patterns and, uh, kind of things like that are you using to, uh, Man, hunt them during know, a the lot daytime? Of, a lot of deer hunters, you know, whatever you're running, you know, a lot of deer hunters after deer season, they're wanting to get in the, 
in a coyote hunt just have something to do in the off season mm-hmm. just wear whatever camo you've been wearing it'll work you know i'm I, i'm a big real tree guy i wear real tree edge and real tree escape most of the year and it works it doesn't matter where i'm hunting and whether i'm hunting in kentucky whether i'm hunting the sagebrush flats in wyoming hunting up in the uh dark timber and big wide open country of uh of the panhandle of idaho and northeastern oregon or if i'm down the sagebrush in arizona and new mexico or back to the prairie ground in, in kansas that stuff's working and we're calling up coyotes close and i mean they just uh they just you know if you if you set up right you know it, you can you can get away with a lot of stuff and can I, you know i like camo you don't hear about some people won't even run use camo you know, I've killed coyotes as close as six steps, nine steps, Jesus. 15 steps. I mean, where you can reach out and hit them with the end of your gun barrel. So running, running real tree, real tree edge, and real tree timber and all that stuff, you, you call coyotes up pretty daggone close. Now, do you white out? Like, you know, you've got about a foot uh, snowpack there. Do you, do you believe in whites or do you just run regular camo? I, I definitely, you know, definitely. Cause I mean, you know, you could, you can kind of stick out like a sore thumb. Uh, usually, uh, what I'm still trying to do is, is get around some brush or trees where I'm still breaking up my silhouette and blending in with my camo. All right. Now, um, and, and this is kind of a rigged question because there's never a tried and true answer, but I, as a generality, you know, when you're talking peak times to hunt coyotes, which is going to be from December to February, what does your typical scenario look like? You know, how long is the stand? You know, what do you start off with? What are your go-to c- calls or noises or sounds? Right. Kind of paint a picture of what that is for the listeners. So, what, what time frame did you give me? December through February. Yes, I'm. I'm. We're trying to think like the most. You know, again, we're a podcast for the blue collar boys and girls out there. Right. They're they're right. done with deer season and now they're switching deer se- gears. Deer season's over. You killed you, you killed you big Boone and Crockett buck and you rattled up. <laughs> and killed November, right? Yep. <laughs> All right. So. December, towards the end of, end of November, going through December, I'm using a lot of prey distress. It's usually when I'm really hitting my uh, rabbit distress is really hard. Uh, some stands I'll run, uh, uh, you know, my bird sounds, but I'm a I'm a cottontail distress type guy. I love cottontail distress. It's one of the things with fox pros. If you can't find a whole handful, maybe even two handfuls of fox pro rabbit sounds that work for you, You've got a lot more problems on your hands than your calls. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was t- I mean, there's just so many. There's dozens. I mean, dozens of. Uh, I always get asked all the time, "What's my favorite rabbit sound?" And you know, I'm like, "Well, today it was cagey cottontail. Used it was eastern cottontail. Tonight it might be adult cottontail. Mrs. McCotton. I mean, I just go on forever. I just have so much luck with cottontail sounds. So that's what I'm running uh, for my most part through december of course i'm finishing out my stands with a little bit of pup or something if i don't have nothing that bites on my rabbits and usually what i'm doing is running through december is about a 12 to 15 minute stand i'm not a guy that sits on a stand forever um i'm i'm a daytime hunter so what i'm doing is concentrating on areas um where coyotes lay up for the day to build up so i'm crowding those areas and if a coyote don't show up pretty quick uh, then i'm getting out of there because i know or I should, you know, I should say that I know, but I've got a pretty good idea that I think I'm within 300 yards of a coyote. So if he's not there within 12 or 15 minutes during the de- there's December time, I'm getting up and going somewhere else. So I'm running usually two different rabbit distresses. I'll run one for four to six minutes, and it depends on the stand whether I'm pausing in between or just letting it run all the way through. Then I'll wait about a minute. And then I'll change to another rabbit distress and run it for four to six minutes. And then I'll close out those last couple minutes with a, uh, with a pup distress, like pup distress number three or pup screams or pup two or whatever. Uh, then when it gets about Christmas time, right after Christmas, I'm actually changing my sequence up a little bit. I'll run just one rabbit distress in case there's a coyote out there that's, uh, that's hungry, it's close. I'll still run that four to six minutes. Nothing shows up. And I'm starting playing howls. I'm starting to sort in some of my female uh, female howls. And sometimes I'll even start my stand out with that as well. You know, bleeding off with a set of howls and then going to rabbit. Uh, then, of course, still finishing off with pup distress sounds. 
and going into January, get on into about the middle of January through this time right here, I'm really picking up the vocals. I still like to run rabbit distress a little bit. Almost every stand uh, this time of year, like I said, I'm setting up on spots where I think I might have a coyote close. So I'll start out with just really light 40 to 50% volume of my favorite rabbit distress uh, on a stand. If nothing shows of that in two minutes, the reason I'm running just two minutes, just in case there's a coyote right there close that starving to death wants to come in there and get a rabbit. Nothing shows up. That's when I'm really picking up my coat vocals. You know, just four or five minutes in, I'm howling, waiting two or three minutes, and then answering back with a different set of howls. Then I might let out some female whines and pup distress burst and growls and stuff like that, just kind of creating a breeding-type sequence scenario. And that's pretty much my December through February-type column. Wow. That, that yeah. was comprehensive. Yeah, appreciate that. That's That was a great answer. We, uh, I went out coyote hunting just a couple of days ago, and how's worked for me. It's Again, we're no experts. We dabble in it. We love it. Um, but it's just interesting to see the progression, how, how you start heavy with distress, more opportunistic calls, and then get into more of, of understanding a coyote's language there right. towards this time exactly. of year. Exactly. Yeah, and that's and that's the thing. And you want know, to be a consistent coyote hunter. You've got to continually be adjusting your calling sequences for whatever time of year it is. You know, there are sounds I'm going to be running in late spring, early summer that I will never even think about running right now. Uh, you know, and, and just like even through December through this time of year, if I start running something and it's working, I'll keep running that sequence until it quits working, and then that's when I adjust it. See what I'm saying? I mean, it's just always continually uh, just playing off how the coyote are reacting. All right. So now, kind of like the all-encompassing question here of the of this podcast, this informational thing is, what are one or two of the most important things a coyote hunter can do? Um, pay attention to the wind is number one. I think that is especially for new hunters that coming into the sport they do not respect the wind or i should say they don't respect a coyote's nose um we can get you in trouble quicker than anything everything that a coyote does in its lifetime the wind dictates it whether it's you know just traveling whether it's moving to a food food source breeding season looking for a mate or split up from its mate and start looking for us, mate. Of course, they do vocal stuff too, but they, you know, they use that nose in every aspect of their life. So the first thing that you do when you start calling on a stand, say you went to a spot and you're trying to key in on this thicket, you got a coyote laid up, and you sit down and your wind is blowing from you right to that thicket, well, your hunt is over before it ever started. He might not smell you before you start calling, but as soon as you start calling, the first thing a coyote does after he perks his ears up and listens is he sticks his nose up, up in the air and takes a big big sniff in. And guess what? He's going to catch a big molecule of collins that's <laughs> over trying to call, yeah. and the hunt is over. It's just how it is. There's no <laughs> scent control that you can do. It is over. So that is definitely um, number one uh, is that. I'd say number two is not being uh, proficient with your with your uh, shooting setup. You know, so many guys go out there deer se- you know deer seasons over with like we talked about. Uh, they say they killed a deer with their their bow, then they pick up the rifle that they ain't shot in ten months, and they go out there and expect they're gonna hit every shot they take. And that's just not usually how it works. So you know, not being proficient with your shooting setup is probably number two, not having the proper practice. And number three. It's just, uh, I would say, I don't know. That's a good question what number three is. The number one and number two, you probably run up or use everything else falls into place after that. <laughs> if you got to, if you got them on track. Sure. So we've kind of uh, covered, you kind of covered both sides there for us, John. What what Garrett's crest question was, was, you know, what are the most important things? And we covered the wind, which it's crazy to me because we've talked to you, the third person we've talked to that said the wind is the number one most underrated thing that people mess up. You have to pay attention yep. to the wind. Uh, by I far, like, by yeah. far. Um, kind of a mistake then, kind of going on that token of Garrett's question, the biggest mistake, do you think that's the biggest mistake that a coyote hunter would make would be not paying attention to the wind and not practicing and putting their due diligence and time to learning their rifle and things like that? Would that be your biggest mistake as well? Yeah, yeah. And then another thing I guess it would add up to be is being complacent. 
And when I say being complacent, I don't know if I'm using the right terminology, but when I'm on stand, when I start, uh, you know, I'm expecting to kill a coyote every single time. And for every single second that I'm on a coyote stand, I'm ready to kill one. Those times that you kind of start daydreaming or thinking about that next stand or you're not, you know what I'm saying? You're not paying attention to what's going on right then. That's usually get you in trouble. Because a lot of times if you're, you know, if you're kind of letting your mind wander somewhere else, that's when those coyotes come in. And that can get you in trouble. That can cost you coyotes. It costs you a bobcat, whatever you're hunting. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's something I see when I take other people hunting sometimes on stands or we'll be sitting up on a spot and I can just see it in their eyes. They're looking around like, yeah, we ain't going to kill no coyotes. Why the hell he's taking me all these gar hoes he's got? And, <laughs> and say 12 minutes into the stand, they're really getting like, you know, man, I can't wait. You know, where we eating breakfast at? And all of a sudden, here comes a three pack rolling in, and guess what? They missed their coyote is going to kill. Right. So, you know, that's that's one of the big mistakes. You got to be ready to kill a coyote every single second you're on a coyote stand. And another thing is, when that call starts, as soon as it starts, you better be ready to shoot because you never know. When you, you might have a coyote laid right out there in a the field in front of you. It's in this little dip bedded up that you can see as you walk in, and he was dead asleep. As soon as you start calling, he pops up and you kill him in 25 seconds. Right. And that happens. That happens all the time. I wish so all of them happened it. like that, but it does no, happen. Man, wouldn't it? It'd be all right, wouldn't it? <laughs> it's like my, it's my coat, like tokened term when we go coyote hunting, like we'll, we'll hit the call and then in about 30 seconds in, I'll be like, well, it's not one of those hunts. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so so one of the cool things we have here is a would you rather segment now there's no it's don't stress on these too hard but um okay. it's going to try to stump you and give you some hard questions here so uh, you have it's just w- one day right in one day um would you rather shoot one 45 pound coyote or shoot three 25 pound coyotes give me those three numbers man <laughs> all right so then we you're you're hunting a coyote tournament Okay, so you got two days to hunt. Would you yep. rather have a semi-auto shotgun or a single-shot rifle? A rifle. Okay. Single-shot rifle. Now, would you rather have a semi-automatic twenty-two mag or would you rather have a single-shot two forty-three? Give me a two forty-three. He's, he's, I thought you said this was going to stump me. Up, Man, me they fight. stumped the other guys. You just, <laughs> are, you, you got your mind made up. Okay. Man, I can go. I can even go back and tell you reasons why for every one of them. Okay, so I, I'm going to get on a side tangent here. Do you have? Or is a shotgun in your arsenal? Do you take no. a shot? No, no, you, you don't no. ever. Okay. And I can tell you why. It's simple. A rifle can make every single shot that a shotgun can't. But guess what? A shotgun cannot make every shot that a rifle can. Yeah, very well said. That's simple. Very well said. All right. So now, I don't know how, I know you deer hunt. I'm not, I'm not sure how heavy. Yes, sir. So would you rather hunt coyotes? You had to pick one or the other. And these are geared around the other other game that we love to hunt. Would you rather hunt coyotes in November or in April? Well, I would, would I rather hunt coyotes in November versus April? Yep. Oh, November, no doubt. Really? Man, I don't think you could pry me out of a tree. <laughs> I, I got, I, there's two reasons I ain't hunting April for coyotes that I would throw that away. First thing is, is I've got uh, coyotes that's got either pups in their belly, mamas with pups in their bellies, or they got pups in the ground raising up my next crop to kill that following season yeah and the other the second part of it is is i got uh, a goblin you go strut in kentucky long beers chase yeah oh yeah yes sir yes sir so here's another one for you would you rather shoot a wolf or a mountain lion mountain lion i've actually i've i try to hunt i've hunted mountain lions almost every single year since 2005 and i have not been able to connect on them and i will kill a mountain lion before i ever go kill a wolf really well, yes, sir. take this for what it's worth. We have some really great friends out in Colorado that uh, kill some exceptional mountain lions. Uh, they own a company called Sandy Hills Hunting Company. Um, and if you if you really get the hanker and you should reach out to them, Jeremy Fiscus is the owner. I think uh, I will look, I will look them up for sure. Yeah, for sure. it's it's incredible. Um, we've hunted out there with them for for all kinds of stuff. We've never been mountain lion hunting, but it's I've never been. People people underestimate how physically demanding that is. They think, oh, you let the oh, dogs out. No, no, you got to go. Yeah. You got to go get to them. 
man. Oh, it's it's crazy. And usually, almost every single year, what I've tried to do is I'll buy permits in a couple states, and I'm actually trying to call for them, trying to call one up. Whoa! And I actually had the opportunity back in it was either 2009 or 2010, somewhere in there in uh, Oregon, and I I screwed it up. It was one of those times, just like we was talking about earlier about on the stand. Uh, I got complacent. You know, I, I was, didn't think it was ever going to happen. And guess what? No There's way. No <laughs> way. <laughs> and the sucker got away, dude. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, I learned to learn hard lessons like that. And then I have been on, uh, I think two years ago, we went to New Mexico on a dog hunt. And it was one of the most, just like you said, it was one of the most demanding things I've ever been on. Weather moved in. It was nuts, dude. Blizzard come through. We were staying in wild tents. I didn't take a shower for 10 days. <laughs> Rode a horse, was riding horses for 20, 20-some 20 miles a day, sometimes 30-some miles a day. It was the demanding. You know, get off in these treacherous places where horses, you know, it's too dangerous for them, and you're trying to climb and walk and drag a horse behind you. It's crazy, crazy. Man, it gives you a whole new respect for those animals. Yeah, man, it's crazy. Yeah, they're, they're so much respect for them. So my last one here, and maybe this will be harder. Uh, hopefully it is for you. <laughs> this is for the entire month of January, okay? Uh-huh. You can have one day that's lights out. You stack up 12 coyotes, you personally, yep. or you kill 30 one every day in January. I take one every day in January. Spreading it out. That's yes, back sir. to the numbers game. So, Spread, spreading it out, and I enjoy being out. So well, you, I'm going to be, I, oh, yeah. I'm going to be out. I'd rather kill, I'd rather kill one a day through January is kill 12 in one day. Right. That means I kill more coyotes and I got to experience the outdoors a lot more along the way. Well, John, this is uh this is kind of the close of the podcast here. Again, we want to thank you for coming on. Um, I think, I think you're going to get a pleasant little surprise. Like I said, we had quite a few people say we need to have you on, um, and before we leave, just remind everybody where they can find your show, where they can find you. I mean, you've got a, a stout following on social media, but but again, let everybody know where they can find you, find sure. more of what you do. Sure. Like on Facebook, just look for me, John Collins. It's J-O-N, people. It's not J-O-H-N. <laughs> just J-O-N. On Facebook, look me up, holler at me. Wired Outdoors on Facebook and Tooth and Claw TV on Facebook. Wired Outdoors on Instagram. And there's John underscore underscore Collins three on Instagram. He's usually putting a lot of cool stuff up there, little fast videos of coyotes biting the dust. It's a pretty cool little account to follow. I even enjoy watching my stuff. I go back because, you know, I like watching coyotes die. So if you like watching coyotes Instagram, you go check out that Instagram account. Then again, uh, we've got a show going on, people. Wired Outdoors and Tooth and Claw TV. Tooth and Claw TV is 100% predator hunting. You can watch it on Amazon Prime, Amazon Fire roku and waypoint tv and of course you can find us on youtube all right buddy you can even you can even find us on tiktok now listen guys don't be laughing at when i say tiktok oh you're yeah 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 yeah. i i don't knock it hey we got some cool videos on tiktok and you won't see no dancing it's just coyotes running in and bobcats and then probably taking a dirt nap that's right. Well, yeah, I can't show it on TikTok. See, that's the bad thing about TikTok. I can't show, I can't show that bullet passing through. Them. Oh well. <laughs> Any uh, anything else before we go, John? Man, just appreciate you guys having me on, and uh, hopefully, hopefully you guys enjoyed it, and hopefully anybody that listens enjoys it. I had a good time being on it. Absolutely. Well, John, I'll touch base with you here after we wrap this up. But again, thanks for taking some time, and uh, I'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you, guys. See you. Yeah. See thank you. you. Pretty cool dude, huh? Again. Yeah. What a good guy. So, um, Jacob Latimer, if you're listening, um, he was one of the first guys that reached out, and then it was kind of like that snowball effect, it seemed like. Um, Jacob said, hey, this guy's a Kentucky native. Reach out to him. He's like, I follow him. And and um, and then here come a couple more to recommend John. And mm-hmm. um, it It's just so it's so interesting, right? To, now that we're three deep, and we've had two really night hunters. Now we have a day hunter to see similarities and yep. differences in calling setups and in gear and, and the definite things to do, the definite things not to do. Mm-hmm. So I think by the time we get done with the series, it's going to be pretty damn interesting. Um, and we got a couple other ones lined up where we're hoping we can launch them in a row. There might be a couple day or two voids, maybe. Um, but still, 
Um, this is the last part, or I shouldn't say last part. This is far from the last part, but this is the third part of a multi-part series. Um, we've got some other guys on the hook. We just got to get everything lined up to get them out. So hopefully the, uh, the following episodes will land on Thursday and Friday, but they might be spread out a little bit. Either way, these three guys, man, they're just all three of them, coyote killers. And I know I have learned a lot. You know, again, uh, it, it's just, it's humbling. You think, you know, like you said earlier, a good year for us, 10. Yeah. <laughs> a good day for them is 10. <laughs> a good three hours for them could be 10. Two good sits for them could be 10. You know, like I, I think the coolest thing for me has been just seeing all the commonalities. Every single person, their number one, number one most important thing to pay attention to is a coyote's nose. It could win you from, you know, 500 plus yards away and i think it's been pretty interesting to to hear all of them kind of commonly say towards the beginning of the season in your earlier winter months your december your january that they're running more of the distress caliber calls and later into february when that mating season's running around um and kind of coming to fruition they're switching to vocals so that's another great tip uh it's been pretty interesting to hear how they set up and they've been setting up, you know, like Chris Creener, uh, he was episode 84 came on Michigan triple digits, coyote killer every year, uh, awarded Michigan predator hunter was sets up in the middle of the, in the middle of the field, right in the, right in the middle, right yeah. in the middle of the open. You know, that's something that we've never done before, but he murders the shit out of coyotes. Yep. And then we get into Aussie who has one. I don't even know how many coyote tournaments in Illinois and beyond who's killed uh, last year. He said 320 coyotes in a year. Right. That's incredible. And learning how, you know, from his podcast saying like all of the work that I do is mostly in the front end. Like I'll go locate coyotes during the night. And like, that's something that you and me like, Oh yeah, there's a coyote that we hear over them. there. We yeah. hear them, but we're not like actively going to all of our spots that we and have listening. permission to, to, to listen or to try to fire them off and locate, all right, this is where the den could potentially be. So that's the big thing that I took away from Ozzy's is like how much actual mental work he does in the front end. Yeah. And then we get into Collins here to John's podcast. And it's like, I think the biggest thing that I took away from him was, you know, uh, you can, you, if you set up, you have to expect to call a coyote in, right? And he's expecting to kill a coyote every time. Which, to me, I've heard many, 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 many people say it. You know, a good coyote hunter kills on one out of every like five or six sets. Well, not John. That's not his attitude. He's saying, "I'm going. Why am I going to waste time? I'm going to go in and expect to kill a coyote every time." And I thought that was really awesome for him. So, if you want to hear the in-depth version of any of those podcasts, again, Chris Creener, eighty-four, hunting coyotes at night in Michigan with Thermal Optics, Ozzy Clements. Big Coyote Tournament Killer, um, triple digits every year from Illinois. That's episode 85. And then this one, 86 with John Collins, 87 and 88 coming in the coming in the ranks yep. and in the chamber. So um, hopefully that we can launch those again for you guys back to back tomorrow and the day after that. So um, until next time, do you have anything? No, just I think before we close, thank you for listening. You know, you guys make this possible. Um, our numbers continue to rise and, and I just want you to know we appreciate it. So um, we, we're not perfect people by any means. We're just trying to put out something that's enjoyable. I think this series has been something that's needed to be out there for a little while. And by having these different guys from different areas share their tactics and tactics and tips. I mean, that's, that's the name of the game, man. Our buddy Cody Jenkins once said, we want to have the tallest skyscraper in the city. And it's because we build it not by knocking other people down. So on that note, don't waste it. We'll catch you on the next one.